Hello everyone, you're watching Mario's History Talks. I'm Mario Rostovsky, and we have a terrific show for you this evening. So, we left off last time talking about, or describing I should say, the mainstream narrative uh, surrounding the emergence of the so-called Slavic speakers in both the Balkans and Macedonia and Bulgaria. Now, for all its flaws, as we said, we can still point to the fact that different Slavic tribes settled in Macedonia than those that settled in Bulgaria, which resulted in different cultures, different people, and different identities forming over the centuries. So let's go back to that idea in a little more detail now and see what I mean. This is where the fun really gets started. So let's get going. So, as we said, in around 615 AD, the Macedonian Slavs, under leadership of the local chieftain Hadzon, attempted to take over Salonika. And as we alluded to previously, this is actually a very pivotal moment in our nation's history that explains a lot about our current day problems. But that is a subject for another episode. So, Hadzon attempts to raid the city, but he is killed within the city walls by a mob. And shortly thereafter, the beginning of the end was spelled for the Avars to the north, which, as you remember, were a Turkic nomadic group in the Danubian Basin stretching to Central Asia. So in 620, roughly, the Avars tried to launch an allied attack on Constantinople, and this included an allied group consisting of Avars, Slavs, Bulgars, and many others. This attack, as you can imagine, was unsuccessful. Afterwards, many groups seeing the weakness of the Avars started to rebel against their rule, including this group in Central Asia called the Bulgars. This hano turkic group was located in between the Caucasus and the Sea of Azov in Central Asia and was ruled at the time by a man named Kubrat. And after he managed to rid the empire of the Avars in 635 AD, he united the various Bulgar tribes into a state called Old Great Bulgaria. Now, he eventually dies in roughly 642 AD, leaving his sons, five sons, to migrate and seek their fortunes in new land in roughly 660 AD. Our focus will be on two of his sons. Now, the more famous of the sons, Asparuch, crossed with, along with his people into Mesia in roughly 670 AD to form a Bulgar state there in 680 AD. But it is the other son that the Bulgars love to bring up to solidify their claims to Macedonia. His name was Kuber, and as mentioned before, he tried to set up a Bulgar state in Macedonia. But what actually happened? Well, Kuber initially migrated to the Pannonia region where the Avars, seeing his royal bloodline, gave him authority over a region called Syria, there in, which is a modern-day Sedev. The inhabitants of this region, obviously not including his native Bulgars, were called by the chroniclers of the time Seremasianoi, and they were the descendants of the captives taken by the Avars after Hazon's failed attack 60 years earlier. So it's all coming together. As such, they were a mixed conglomerate of Roman Christians, Slavs, and many others that were in the Byzantine at the time. However, Seeing that his subjects still wanted to return to their native lands, Kuber launched a revolt against the Avars in 670 AD. And by 680, he led his roughly 70,000 person mixed army down to Macedonia to an area called the Keramesian Plain. Here is where the story gets interesting. So let's run through, in all fairness, the Bulgarian perspective on what happens next. So. Before even launching his attack on the Avars, according to Bulgarians, Kuber had established a Bulgarian identity amongst the mixed population in Pannonia, specifically the Seremasianoi. So he arrives in Macedonia and settles the Keramesian Plain, which apparently extended from the Plain of Bitola all the way over to Albania. And while in Macedonia, he and his people set up a second Bulgar state in Macedonia, and the other, why I say second, is Asparuk state to the east. And while they're there, apparently they mix with the local Slavic population, 
and as they did up north, create a Bulgarian national consciousness as well. And by the time of the actual Bulgarian expansion into Macedonia from the east, the two states simply merged. And Hubar's presence in Macedonia not only left behind a strong Bulgarian national consciousness amongst the Slavic population, but also even affected the local folk costumes in the Bitola and Prilep region as well. So there you have it. The origin of the Bulgarian claims to modern Macedonia start with Khan Huber. So first of all, let's get all the laughs out of our system now and explain why this is absolutely nonsense. First of all, for this theory to hold any water, the Bulgars must have been some serious, and I mean serious marketers of their national identity for other people since if we follow the Bulgarian logic here, within 20 years, Kubar made his mixed religion, mixed language, mixed culture people into one people, the Bulgarians. Absolutely credible. I wish I knew how he did this. And even then, the Bulgars know that this is not possible. So historically, some historians like Zlatarsky have tried to bump up the incubation period up to 60 years even though this flat out contradicts when we know Kubar's father died and when he would have actually migrated to the Pannonian uh, Basin. So kind of a contradiction there. But then we're told after they leave Pannonia, eventually they arrive and they settle in Macedonia in the Karamesian Plain, which typically is said to be centered around Bitola, but in some fantasies on Facebook also extended over to Albania because why not? So what's the issue here? Well, we really don't know where this plane is since we don't use this uh, toponymy anymore, but we know it probably wouldn't have been centered in Bitola. But why did the Bulgars insist repeatedly it was in Bitola? Well, it's so that their imagined Bulgar state would cut deep into the center of not only geographic Macedonia, but also the Republic of Macedonia as well which we know is an imperative of the Bulgar foreign policy agenda. However, looking at primary sources, particularly those of the miracles of St. Demetrius, which we have a documentation not only of Hazan's attack on Salonika, but also Kuber's attack, and is written by the perspective of an anonymous author actually living in Solon, he said that the Bulgars settled in our region which, of course, would point right to Bitola, despite it's roughly 200 kilometers away. So people like Professor Fine say that it's probably not going to happen. And honestly, folks, take a look. See any resemblance between me and my great-great-great-great-cousin, apparently? I don't think so. But apparently, while in Macedonia, <laughs> Kuber establishes a super-duper special second Bulgarian state. Now, this time in Macedonia, to coincide with Asparus to the east. Pretty neat, huh? Children in Bulgaria are taught this story from elementary school. They know it by heart, but it's just that. It's a story. There's almost no archeological evidence pointing to a permanent established Bulgar state in Macedonia. Most of it is actually Avar from their time in the Balkans. But since the Bulgars lived amongst the Avars, it's actually pretty hard to state definitively. It is not a close case by any regard. And if there was a Bulgar state, it surely would have been recorded. Take a look at the Bulgar necropolises in the Balkans from the time period. Notice anything? I'll give you a couple minutes. But this much is certain. The Bulgar identity and authority was not embraced by anyone. Not the local Macedonians, and definitely not the Serimasianoi. Well, how do we know this? This is part of the story that the Bulgarians actually don't really like mentioning. First of all, we see that the Macedonians were still following orders from the emperor, from the Byzantine Empire, and not Kuber, since the emperor actually ordered them to at least supply Kuber and his army was some food by the local Dragoviti tribe. And moreover, and this is actually my favorite part of the story, <laughs> as soon as Kuber arrives in Macedonia, his army disintegrates 
it deserts him. <laughs> Remember how I said that most of his army was actually made up of descendants of old Byzantine captives from the region from 60 years prior? Well, poor old Cooper got played big time. Soon as he actually liberated them from the Avars and brought them to their native Macedonia, they all fled his rule and they all tried returning to their homes as was their initial goal. And why wouldn't they? They had no semblance of any Bulgarian identity or loyalty among them. Take a look at this coin from Kuber's general Mavros. Even his own general distinguished between the Bulgars and the city Masianoi, and it was under no illusion that they by this point had formed one people as Bulgarian historians like Zlatarsky would have us believe. So much for that strong Bulgarian identity, like everywhere. <laughs> but what happens next? Well, Kuber throws a tantrum, much like the Bulgarians of today, and tries to get the Byzantine Empire, or the EU today, <laughs> to intervene and to keep his subjects at bay from fleeing. Now, of course, he's basically laughed out of the emperor's face, so good old Kuber tries to go to war with the Byzantine Empire, and he tries to take Salonika once more. So, does he succeed? Absolutely not. St. Demetrius once again intervenes. Kuber and his agents are unmasked, and his entire plan fails. Thank you, Sveti Dimitria. And this is actually an important fact to realize that most people don't. The Bulgars never, ever, and I mean ever, occupied nor settled in Salonika. Yet, somehow, and really, really try to suspend your reality here, St. Kirill and Metodi, they were Bulgarians. And the Slavic language spoken by the inhabitants at the time the Bulgars were still largely speaking Turkic and Greek is still called Bulgarian. I mean, come on. But anyway, after all this time, we have almost no record of Kuber and his Bulgars. Professor John Fine says he and his people essentially disappear from the written record after 688 as any form of unit or even semi-state. Notice he never says state. But once again, if you listen to the Bulgars from the period 670 to 688, Kuber still somehow manages to make the local Macedonians into Bulgars, even though he failed miserably to do the exact same thing with his own city Masianoi in roughly the same amount of time. Oh, and this is really isn't even drawing a breath on, but the whole idea that Kuber somehow left behind Bulgar influences in our folk costumes also borders on the absurd. Not only were Kruber's soldiers ethnically mixed, and the Bulgars obviously a minority, and if anything, would have actually been wearing Avar uniforms from their time in the Avar Khangate. But Bulgars point to the Chaushush Bulgars in Asia for similarities in our folk costumes. Now, this again points to a Central Asian Turkic origin for the Bulgarians, but outside of that proves absolutely nothing. Macedonians have similarities in folk costumes with most of the Balkans and even parts of the Near East. We know that we have many cultural influences, but nonetheless, this is a really desperate last-ditch effort to prove something that's simply not there. So, what are our takeaways today? Well, Kuber ruled over a mixed population, the minority of which were actual Bulgars. And based off the written record and the accepted chronology of historical events, it would have been next to impossible for him to significantly alter the cultural, let alone the ethnic makeup of Macedonia. It didn't happen in Sirium and Srem, and it certainly didn't happen in Macedonia. But did some Bulgars actually settle in Macedonia? Sure, we know some were shipped off to Constantinople, others to Epirus, but a small number could have still remained in Macedonia and been absorbed by the local population. No one here is claiming racial purity. In fact, some Bulgars also settled as far as Italy during the same exact time period in greater numbers. But the fact remains that in Macedonia, it was the Slavic cultural identity of the Macedonians that prevailed 
that rejected the influence of the Hanno Turkic Bulgars from actually absorbing them, vice versa. And from this point on, it would not be until 843 AD that the Macedonians would even find themselves under any permanent Bulgarian rule or Bulgarian authority. Once again, during this gap, two people, two cultures, two languages develop almost independently of one another. And we will explore all the details of that in our next episode, precisely what caused the lines to eventually be blurred between the Macedonians and the Bulgarians. But until next time, folks, be sure to connect with me on Twitter or Facebook. Links down below, as always, as I'm going to be posting some goodies over the next coming days. And I'll see you again soon. You know I'm back. So stay safe. And as always, keep fighting for Macedonia. I'll see you next time, folks.